Well, we are very fortunate now to welcome Graham Reed, one-man developer working on the upcoming arcade space shooter for Xbox and PC, Super Space Club. Graham, thank you so much for joining me today. What's well, good? Thanks for having me. I'm excited to have you to, to talk to you. Uh, I I know Super Space Club is we're about a month or so, a little month and change out from release, yep. but uh, August fourth. Yeah, you excited? Yeah, <laughs> finally it's finally happening, right? Like, yeah, very excited. Yeah. Are you nervous? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How long have you been working on Super Space Club? Uh, it's a tricky question. I've been like, I've been working on it since 2019, but really on and off. So it's not like consistent development, you know? Mm -hmm. You are yeah. a one man developer. Is that right? Yep. Yep. Just, just me. I've, I've, I've collaborated with people. So I worked with Fat Bart on the dope soundtrack, my favorite part of the game. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I had a couple of illustrators come through and help me with the characters, with the key art, like that kind of stuff. But then mm -hmm. just developing the game is just me. So I want to talk more about Super Space Club, but first I want to get a feel of your journey in game development. When did you start working on game development? Started in 2012. It's my last year of college. Um, mm -hmm. Me and two other, three other friends from Jamaica, we did a game jam. And then it was like, oh yeah, we, we can make games. Like it was just a, it unlocked something for us, you know? Um, mm -hmm. But then we didn't even use Unity. We used another... <laughs> unfortunately named a game engine called corona <laughs> go figure right mm -hmm. right <laughs> um and yeah we, we started making games from then and it was mostly mobile games at that time and so yeah super space was my first non-mobile game which is exciting yeah so your first games were on ios and android hectocube mm -hmm. and shapes and sound is that right yeah so shapes and sound is the one i made with the friends and hectocube was my first solo developed game what kind of games were they it's also like small, smaller arcade. I mean, especially for mobile, like smaller arcade pick up and play experiences, you know? Mm -hmm. And did that inform your experience to making Super Space Club? Yes and no. Like, I think because it's just me and I'm, I'm still, I'm not a programmer by, by trade. Like I'm a, I went to college for motion graphics. I'm more in the art side. Mm -hmm. And then God bless YouTube because like, that's how I learned to do <laughs> everything basically. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just figured, what can I make that's something small, fun, action based? Um, and yeah, Super Space Club was what, what came to mind because I just have a thing for those kind of games, like House Mark style games. Like, I just love that kind of stuff. So, or kind of that. I, is, that, is that Xbox Plus? I should say Geometry Wars style games. <laughs> you can, hey, we love them all. We love them all. And House Mark makes some incredible experiences. No, they're they're one of the best. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. 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 Big time. So uh, leaving school in roughly 2012, mm -hmm. working on mobile titles, uh, and then beginning work on your first uh, Xbox game in 2019, but on and off. Am I getting that timeline right? Yep. Yep. If you're working on and off, how are you paying bills then? Are you working in other game development, <laughs> that kind of thing? I wish. No. So um, I freelance a lot it just in motion graphics for ad agencies, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Probably the... I'm trying to think of what people would know that I worked on. I guess, like, do you know Spike TV? Yeah, sure. So I worked on, I helped work on all the animation and rebrand for Spike TV back in 2014, I think. Mm -hmm. So stuff like that, that kind of stuff. Um, and then in 2015, I joined Snapchat, which was a fun, long seven years of my life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so that, years. that, that, yeah, I was there for seven years. Yeah. It's a very long time to be at one place. It was fun, Gosh. though. It was fun. Yeah. Very cool. So you said seven years. Does that imply that now you are full time in game development? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I, I left in twenty twenty one. It was a it's a very crazy timeline because twenty twenty, of course, pandemic happened, mm -hmm. um, and I also had my first child, had a son, and then the next year, and also moved, got a house, because <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, during the pandemic, everyone is moving, trying to move out. I'm I'm in New York City, so everyone is trying to move out of the city. And with a child, I wasn't trying to stay in the city anyway. Mm -hmm. And then 2021, I was like, I just couldn't do it anymore. Like, I, I feel like I saved off enough at that point to just try doing this on my own. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Well, you're on yeah. the eve of finding out if if going on your own was the right call there. That's nerve wracking, <laughs> exciting, fun. No, it, I think it was definitely the right call. It's just it took longer than I thought to get here. Yeah. <laughs> like, this should have come out two years ago. 
<laughs> well, uh, let me ask you this. You are now full-time in games. You're working on mm-hmm. Super Space Club. The the pitch for Super Space Club, I could read it to the listeners, but I want to hear your version first. Tell me what the elevator pitch is for Super Space I Club. I feel like you should do both because my I've pitched this game so much. It's just become whatever comes out of my mouth at the time. So right now it's like Super Space Club is dope arcade shooter vibes in space with like mm-hmm. the chillest, coolest soundtrack you'll ever hear in a game. It has like reggae music, it has French, hip hop inspired things, it has a lot of Black American influences. It's dope. You describe it on the website as a lo-fi arcade space shooter to chill to, defend mm-hmm. a vibrant mm-hmm. galaxy as a club of misfit heroes, and battle endless waves of spacecraft to the tune of atmospheric beasts. Uh, a- atmospheric beats beats, beats. <laughs> yeah. yeah beats um i know that in watching steam next fest demos gorilla collective coverage uh i was enamored with the soundtrack which as you alluded to uh, is by fat bard and it yeah. is so chill so chill tell me a little bit about how you decided to come up with a space shooter with such a lo-fi with that kind of vibe yeah funny enough i think just because when, whenever I'm programming, I can't really listen to any podcast. I can't listen to any music or anything like that. At least not nothing with lyrics. Mm-hmm. And so <laughs> my Spotify, you know, like how Spotify has the that yearly recap that they do. Mm-hmm. So mine used to be a lot of like just different hip hop music or just different dancehall music. And then over time, it became only these random lo-fi so- songs, uh, songs. Like <laughs> mm-hmm. I couldn't tell you any, any other artists, but I just listened to a lot of that lo-fi vibe. Mm-hmm. Um, and just playing the game, I was like, oh, you know, this is kind of so cool with it. And this is also kind of a marketing thing. The, the same exact reason why it looks the way it does, because when you think of space games, it's usually very dark and moody. And if mm-hmm. you do have colors, like a, look at, it looks like a nebula kind of vibe. Mm-hmm. But I just wanted to make a very colorful game. Um, and then some, Sonic was the same thing. Like they all had some really adrenaline, hectic, kind of music mm-hmm. and no, i just wanted to chill it's, it's to me it's um the visually was inspired by um spider-man into the spider-verse oh wow okay yeah because i because at first it was just more muted like black and white mm-hmm. just more of like an homage to asteroids and then i saw that movie and i was like no it's, it's, i need to pump call into it i need to pump life into it mm-hmm. um and then the vibe is like guardians of the galaxy like I, that's probably one of my favorite. The first one, like one of my favorite Marvel movies, mm-hmm. and I don't forget it starts with Peter Quill on some planet. I forget where, mm-hmm. and he's like they're shooting, just killing people. But he's listening to like eighties music, and as, mm-hmm. I, th- I thought that juxtaposition was really significant. Mm-hmm. Like obviously, it left an impression on me too. That one scene that stood out to me. So I feel like I wanted to capture that vibe for Super Space Club, and From, so yeah, please keep going. Oh, sorry. I was going to say, so initially I worked with a guy um, named George Hofnagel, who he made like a sick lo-fi jazzy kind of soundtrack to it. But then he got a really dope job. I think he's over at Netherrealm now working on Mortal Kombat. So he, they were like, yeah, you can come over, but you have to stop on everything you're doing. So we had to part ways, sadly. He's great though. Mm-hmm. Um, but he introduced me to Fat Bard. And so then they came on and put their own spin on it. And then somehow we got like vocalists on. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that's, that's how we're here now. That's so cool. Well, uh, people on YouTube are seeing the trailer and B-roll run next to us. But for any listener that's not watching, this game is a bright, colorful Asteroids game in in so many ways. But that sound, at least to me, is just quintessential to the experience. Like you have to have the sound on to get the, the experience of your game. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Like you, you, you can get it without it, but it's not the same at all. It changes the mood completely. I oh, fully agree, fully agree. And yeah. watching coverage, like I, I'm watching it right now on a second screen, it's different than when I was listening to it. And I think that's hugely important. Would you agree? Yeah, for sure. Like, I think all types of art just depend on, like they rely on all your senses, you know? Like if you're if you're looking at the Mona Lisa, for example, but you're hearing heavy heavy metal music, it's a very different experience than seeing it just in a museum with, you know, a low, like, ambient music or there's no music at all it's like silence it's always different Mm -hmm. so i think the music is integral to the game in that way you've been working on it for let's see four years now since 2019 how has the game changed 
<laughs> since you started? I mean, I've, I've changed as a person, as like a an artist, as a programmer. I've gotten better. So the game is just, I don't think it's changed that much, mm-hmm. but it's also evolved. Like if you go back and look at the older trailers for the game, it's the same, but it's, it's, it, it's clearly gotten like enhancements in the gameplay, in the graphics, in the mm-hmm. music, all that stuff. Do you think uh, there were any lessons that you picked up along the way during development that made like a crucial change or has your vision remained steady throughout? Um, I think in the early years, it it kind of fluctuated because I had a lot of ideas and I had to eventually try and nail down what I wanted to do. Um, But I think probably once the pandemic hit, maybe. Mm -hmm. Once I started to add in the characters and abilities, I think that's when it just kind of locked in and that was just the game is what it is now, but just better. (laughs) You posted a developer blog maybe a year or so ago at this point, that, and you it's talked been too about long. <laughs> it. it has been too long. I enjoyed yeah. them. You should, uh, and any listener should go check out Graham of Legend on YouTube because the de- dev yeah. blogs are really cool. Um, you talked about like the scope of the game. Starting small uh, can be mm-hmm. very mm-hmm. valuable. Can you touch on that a little bit? Yeah, of course. Um, so I think every developer, especially if you're a solo developer, you should start small, just because it's a lot harder to ship a game than you think. Like, if you're just trying to have a hobby and just make this massive thing, then sure, go for it. But it's it's not easy to finish a game. And it's like, yeah, starting small and having that limitation upon yourself, it allows you to really de- delve deeply into that small core idea, you know? Um, and so, like, with Super Space Club, it, even though it's a very simple idea, I feel like it's endlessly replayable because I've tried to put so much into it, into that core idea and polish it. So it just feels good to play every single time. Sounds good to play every single time, you know, looks mm-hmm. good to play every single time. Mm-hmm. And the survival being small. And then if it was any bigger than this, it wouldn't be coming out now. It'd be coming out like three years from now, you know? Mm-hmm. So it's just important to also keep them small to ship them. And you see it with big games today too. Like I think it was Matt Booty the other day who was saying about what was his role at Xbox? He's a oh, he's at Bethesda, right? I think he's like the head yeah, of booty. publishing or something. Yeah. Head of Xbox publishing. Yeah, yeah. He was saying like games these days are taking like seven years, eight years to make. Mm-hmm. And it's just like imagine if you're a game director at, at Xbox or wherever one of those studios, you can make three games in ten years, in in thirty years. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. I can't even imagine that cycle. That's it's ridiculous. The games are amazing. Don't get me wrong, but it's just. I would easily take like a Grand Theft Auto or a Witcher, but make it 30 hours, not 300 hours, you know? And it's Agreed. still going to be a great game. Then you get you get three of them in the same time. Agree. I think that's what they were kind of touching on with the idea of Avowed, with its scope being shifted. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And so I think yeah. what in is the same thing. Like, unless you... Like, let's say, for example, I ship Super Space Club, and then I make, like, five other games that are really really cool, really tight, really polished. I can then mm-hmm. take all those learnings and maybe make something bigger with new tech, with just what I've learned. But for my first handful of games, I can't make anything big because then I feel like that will just keep me stagnant, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, when you're creating a game like this to chill to, difficulty, ease of play has to be a factor there. Um, how do you um... settle on <laughs> how hard to make the game? It's actually pretty hard. <laughs> okay. It's, it's, it's really hard. Like, it, it it ramps up and gets very challenging the further you go, which, I mean, that was kind of the point. Like, I wanted to be able to get into it really easily, mm-hmm. but then always feel like you're being challenged. So it only, like, someone might think the third wave is hard, but to me, that's just, like, the game is just starting, you know? Mm-hmm. And so it's just one of those where the vibe of the game and just how, how the game feels to play is what kind of keeps you, keeps you chill. Mm-hmm. But there's a lot to, a lot to master, a lot of coolness to happen the further you get into the game. Mm-hmm. Is there a way that you decide how hard to like, are you get, gathering feedback from other players from, from the demo? Like you just had a steam next fest demo. Uh, are you tracking like feedback to make adjustments on that? Or is it kind of set in your mind at this point? I mean, at this point, it's kind of set, yeah. But over, mm-hmm. I mean, like I said, it's been four years. So mm-hmm. even though I haven't been developing before, it's, I've been making people play it over the over the, the time, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, the difficulty has fluctuated, and I made certain changes to make different enemies, um, 
just how they make some make some of them harder, some of them easier. Yeah, get, it's get, like making a game like, is all about trying to balance. Like I could never imagine making a fighting game. There's too much balancing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think now eventually it gets very hard. But I think that's the point. Like it's it's it's, it's a challenge. It's always challenging. You can try and be always beat your highest score. You know, because if I if I ultimately locked the difficulty to a certain point, then someone might just some some people might be good enough and just never feel challenged anymore. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. As yeah. I watch uh, gameplay of it, like there's a simplicity to it uh, in terms of like graphical fidelity and like what we're looking at. But uh, amidst all that, I, I see complexity. There's physics involved. You're moving around. Yeah, uh, physics on the is board, the most different... important part to the gameplay. Yeah. Okay, tell me about that then. So I love twin six shooters like Geometry Wars, like those kind of games. Um, but something about the the physics based gameplay to me just really, it's just so much fun. Like, mm-hmm. like have you ever played Rocket League? Yeah, like everybody has at this point. Yeah, yeah, it's one of my one of my favorite. I I played it so much to the point where I can't play it anymore. I just played it too much. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but I just love physics based games like that where. It 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 has it's simple like you 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 press right trigger and you fly and mm-hmm. you point in the direction you want to go and you just go right, mm-hmm. but I wanted it to feel like you're drifting in space like you're actually when you get really good you can be like bobbing and weaving through all the different ships, mm-hmm. all the different bullets out like everything coming at you, and it just it just feels to me it feels better than just a regular twin stick shooter. Mm-hmm. And then all the enemies also operate on that same logic. So it's not like they can do some crazy maneuvers that you can't do and vice versa. It's like everyone's on the same the same page. Gotcha. As you move through waves, what determines the difference between like a wave, wave one, wave two, wave three? Are, are there bosses? Is it a number of enemies? The difficulty of the enemies? What- so <laughs> I, I wanted to make bosses, but that just added more complexity to the game. Mm-hmm. In, I mean, it would have been great, but like, Maybe like in down the line, I'll I'll try and get to that. But for now, it's just different different enemies. So the first wave just starts with the most simplistic enemies, uh, just to kind of get you get your feet wet. Mm-hmm. And then as you go on, more and more enemies enemy types are introduced, and the amount of enemies that come on screen also go up um, mm-hmm. until you get to like the hardest hardest enemy, and then it's just a mis- mis- a mismatch of every different thing coming at you. Gotcha. Uh- Earlier in the interview, you referenced uh, creators of color helping you work on the the project, um, and I forget the exact wording that you used. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, diversity is important, you know. Like, mm-hmm. <laughs> and I'm I'm also, even though I live in New York now, I'm I'm always always about my country. I'm always about Jamaica. Like, I mm-hmm. rep Jamaica every day, mm-hmm. and so it's important to me that I, as an immigrant like pull my people up but then also just get people from all different backgrounds because of course like in america in the game development scene in general i feel like it's kind of underrepresented for as black people for women you know for all the different like we, we've heard this time and time again mm-hmm. sadly, sadly. <laughs> yeah um and yeah so i have for example one of my friends from college i this guy named art class hero this is his rap name He's he's on one of the tracks with um Fatbird produced all the tracks. So he's he's raps on one of the tracks. Mm-hmm. And then my friend Rizik, he's like a Jamaican reggae artist, and he that's probably my favorite track, but I'm biased, but it's like one of my favorite tracks on it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um and I've never heard anything like that in a game. So I kind of want to work with him more to pull more of that out into the game game space. Um and then I have another Jamaican friend who he's an illustrator. He's the one who did the concept design for all the characters, like mm-hmm. just just stuff like that, you know, just trying to bring as many influences and cultural diversity in as I can. How cool I'm a, is I'm it a French artist is is um a woman named Ori. She's like I never thought I'd have a game with French in it, you know, like she's uh, wrapped a whole thing in French. It's so sick. <laughs> that is cool. How cool is it yeah. to see that your art is is helping provide opportunities and uh, collaborations it's great like i i, I love it <laughs> yeah yeah like i i definitely want to like my art this isn't isn't just for me like otherwise i would just keep it to myself you know like i i want everybody to experience and have a get the same things that i got out of playing games when i was younger and today mm-hmm. but then i also want to use 
my platform to uplift others and to help other people just get their work out because everybody, you know, everybody's good at something. Everybody loves, has passions about something. And if it adds to my game, then why not? It's their game too. It's funny how you say that because I discovered uh, you, Graham of Legend. Uh, I discovered <laughs> your work because of Rihanna Manuel on Twitter. Hey. Right? Like, that's how I saw it. Others yeah. I know discover games. Shout in, out to in, Rihanna. Yeah, she's, <laughs> she's the coolest, right? Yeah. Um, but, but. In my new opinion. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I, gotta, I gotta remember that. Because for so long, it was Rihanna. Manuel. I know, right? For so long. But then, yeah. <laughs> Um, but discoverability is difficult. You know, games are, I think, more popular than ever. Uh, mm -hmm, there are more mm -hmm. creators than ever, but still, you know, the industry seems to struggle with diversity of all kinds, discoverability, curation. Um, that's, I think, the big challenge. Is that something that you think is getting better or is it still a problem? <laughs> it's yeah, still a big problem. question big question right <laughs> yeah. no pressure it's definitely, it's definitely still a problem but it's like i don't know where to begin on that is <laughs> that's a very big question Luke. Like, yeah, don't worry about it don't worry about it it's still What's a problem though for sure because like you said it's more people are making games it's getting easier to make games it's still hard but it's getting easier mm -hmm. and i don't know i feel like I can only speak for my experience and like, especially back, back home in Jamaica, people still don't know you can make games. They don't, that's a valid outlet, you know, they don't, mm -hmm. that's a, a, a art form that you can access very easily. And so it's just like, because people are only, and this is just a problem in, in games, but it, 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 it's a big problem in games, obviously. Like people are only hiring what they know. They're only going to the, the places with all the, <laughs> for like a better term, for all, with all the white men, just like <laughs> pulling them, like, you know? Yeah. And not even looking, going, doing the work to look and go find other other things. And some people will be like, oh, but why do I need to go, you know, find a black artist just because they're black? And it's like, no, not just because they're black. You're looking for talented artists. Mm -hmm. You're just looking at different pools than the, the regular pools you've been looking in. Mm -hmm. I work in education. And one of the mantras that we try to do is we want like our school faculty and and the content that we teach to be a reflection of our student body to show different uh, ideas and cultures and uh, right. diversity of that. And I think the gaming industry is slowly be kind of going that way where they're starting to be more slowly. representative, <laughs> yeah. but not there yet, you know? Definitely not there yet, no. <laughs> well, let's switch gears slightly I think, then. Uh, okay, yeah, please. Sorry, please. just touch on that. I think, I think in the, the indie scene is really help, helping with that though. Because obviously anybody can just be an indie developer. Anybody can make games. And so you're seeing a lot more people from all over the world making games, which is obviously the world isn't just, just white men. Yeah. <laughs> and so you're seeing like all women teams, you're seeing all black teams, you're seeing like teams from like Brazil, just from all over the place. And it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's nice to see. And they're actually getting a spotlight because more people are focusing on those kind of games to counter like the, the, the million hour RPG games. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there are a lot of those yeah i only have time for like one or two years i see games like starfield i'm like oh nervous nervous give me that yeah, 30 that hour. and zelda are the only two big games i'm playing today this this year like that's it <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i don't know how i'm gonna get through october man spider-man alan wake Ooh. next year next year <laughs> it's gonna be it's gonna be a while yeah. those are all getting delayed to next year at earliest you know <laughs> yeah for real like for me anyway right exactly yeah so <sighs> We, we touch on the idea uh, of discoverability, the industry getting better. It's it's easier in the indie scene for you. You linked up with Guerrilla Collective and Steam mm -hmm. Next Fest uh, recently. How did that come about? Well, so actually, the, I didn't. <laughs> so Steam Next Fest is funny, right? It used to be you could enter every single Steam Next Fest. Mm -hmm. But I think maybe last year they made it so you could only do one per game. And so I was like, oh, yeah, my game's going to be out in April. And so my my uh, Super Super Space Club was out in next first. The demos in next first in February, mm -hmm. and then I was like, oh yeah, I'm not gonna make make, make April at all. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I was I wasn't able to be in this last next first that just happened. Mm -hmm. um, but I was in the Guerrilla Collective uh, in the start of start of the month, uh, early June. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that was that was dope. I always love being in those kinds of showcases because it's just. They're always so cool. Like even like I'm excited to be in it, but there's always I love being next to all these other dope games. Mm -hmm. Does 
does that help with discoverability? Like, were you able yeah, to see people definitely. catching eyes? Yeah, tell me about yeah. that. Then. Yeah, like, so with with Xbox, it's kind of hard. With any console, like, it's kind of hard to know just how much people want your game because they don't really have the specific wish list kind of system in place. Right. But Steam, everybody can wish list your game, and that's a big metric, like trying to get your wishes up, trying to get your wishes up. Mm-hmm. And yeah, once I'm in any of these showcases, especially Gorilla, I've been in Gorilla Collective twice now. I think the first one was 2019. Mm-hmm. Wow, 2019. I think back then it was like a kind of funny showcase mm-hmm. in partnership with Gorilla Collective, which yep. is dope. And then this past one. And those I've seen the biggest, biggest numbers, bigger than like when I've had a trail on IGN or Polygon or anything. Like the Gorilla Collective has consistently been helpful in actually getting me visibility mm-hmm. and, and then of course also there's black voice in gaming which is like oh it's it's all under the same the mix like they're all actually i don't know if it's part of the mix or not but the, the guy who runs the mix justin woodward he also does black voice in gaming and that's also been very helpful just to not for the game itself but for highlighting black creators which has been great I think we've had Justin on XEP years ago at this point. Oh, no. You should um, get them again. Like, I feel like a lot has changed in the past couple of years. Yeah, I would imagine so. Yeah, because we did have him on, um, I want to say 2020. So when XEP was just oh, starting. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, he's, he's great. And he's also a game developer. Too, so it's not, it's not like he's just a, a business guy. Like, no, he, he's doing this for all of us. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. um, Media Indie, Indie Exchange. That's the mix mm-hmm. acronym, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, gotcha. yeah. Well, you're coming to PC and Xbox in, in mm-hmm. August. Uh, how did you end up deciding on Xbox? Because for all intents and purposes, at this point in development, you're a console exclusive. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, whether you, whether, whether you mean for that pressure or not, uh, that is something that's happening. No, how did you it. end up? It's a good marketing beat. <laughs> okay. All right. Tell me how you linked up with them. Um, so, of course, 2020, the pandemic. Um, just all the all the crap happening in America, like <laughs> with like um you know this mistreatment of black people and all that stuff mm-hmm. and so there were a lot of initiatives from all over like up on all all the different companies to like you know let it's time to make a change mm-hmm. um and so through Xbox they have like a really cool program now it's like a I forget the name of it exactly, but it's essentially like a a diversity program that mm-hmm. they try to find people who are they're making really quality things but just aren't getting showcased, whether it's because of resources, that or lack of resources, I should say, mm-hmm. or just lack of connections to the right people. Because a lot of it is just connections. I've seen, and I mean no shade, but I've seen some games that just aren't that great. <laughs> but because of who they know or the, the links that they've made in the past, or this a publisher, it's like, oh yeah, they're on the Switch. Meanwhile, some people I know, they can't even get a... a a dev kit and a switch dev kit just because they don't have the connections you know mm-hmm. and so i started talking to xbox in 2020 with the, all of that in mind like hey we're trying to bring more indies to the platform more games to the platform more diverse voices to the platform mm-hmm. um and yeah just started working with with the id team <laughs> and that's, that's pretty much the only reason i ended up on xbox because nintendo or sony didn't come to me you know they Funny enough, Stadia also reached out to me mm-hmm. and RIP Stadia. But that was, I'm happy that I didn't like try to talk more with them because I heard it was a nightmare to develop for. <laughs> yeah. 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 What yeah. kind of dev kit do you even work on? That's, that's I do cloud. I don't know. Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, no, Xbox has been, been great. Like the people there, I love them. They're really a genuine and helpful people. And it's, so far, at least, it's, it hasn't been hired to port to Xbox. I, that's all the reason I'm only coming to Xbox right now, because it's just me porting it. Like, I can't focus on three ports at once. You know, that's mm-hmm. ridiculous. <laughs> I can gotcha. barely focus on one. Gotcha. Do you yeah. ever look at, like, the, the like there's ID at Xbox programs that they have at mm-hmm. various points. Um, there's also subscription services. You got Games with Gold, uh, Game Pass. Is that something that, as a developer, you think about? Or does it come to you? Okay, tell me about that. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. So I think every developer, at least every developer at my scale, would Mm -hmm. love to be on any of those things. Like, yeah, give me Game Pass, give me Apple Arcade, give me like, let me be on Netflix, like any of those things, right? Mm -hmm. Because those are 
as far as I understand how they work, I've never actually gotten into these programs, but from what I've understood, from what I've heard, all of those are like guaranteed money. Like, hey, we're going to give you a set amount, like six figures or more, you know, like, mm-hmm. and you're going to be exclusive to our platform for such and such time. Mm-hmm. I know your, your game may launch and you may make millions of dollars or you may make like a thousand dollars, you know, mm-hmm. you never know until the game is out. Because like, I've seen really, really, really good games flop, sadly, yeah. just because any, any, any amount of circumstance that can happen. But with these deals, it's like, oh, yeah, we're going to give you money. And so at the very least, you know, you've made, like, if, if your budget was 20000 to make a game and you get offered a 100000 deal, good, you're done. Like, yeah. <laughs> big, big profit, you know? Mm-hmm. But for some developers, it's like, they might get offered 200000 but they just put a million into the game. And so it's not really beneficial for them. Mm-hmm. That's why I say it depends on the, the scope of your game and how much these deals offer you. Mm-hmm. But for me, yeah, I would easily... Be on one of those just not, even for the money yes but like also because i found that on game pass specifically and and ps plus too i've tried this all i've doubled in a lot of games that i wouldn't have played just because i don't have time to but it's 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 free quote unquote so it's like yeah i can try this for all if i like it then i'll play play more if not then it was fun <laughs> agreed agreed yeah. that's the best and so i'd love to yeah, the best price about it. And so I would love for my games to be on those kinds of services just so people can see if they're like my kind of games or not. Gotcha. Very cool. Well, uh, Graham, I don't want to take uh, too much more of your time. Uh, please let I people know <laughs> where they can go to uh, find you on socials to to look forward to your game. I'll encourage every listener, if you're a PC gamer, wish list on Steam. Thank you. Um, thank you. Seek it out on the Xbox store. It comes out August 4th, yes? Mm-hmm. August 4th, 2023. Yeah. Let people know where to find you, man. <laughs> so you can find me all across the internet on all the different socials at Graham of Legend. You can go to my site, GrahamOfLegend.com. You can go to my YouTube, which which um, you spoke about earlier with all my devlogs and like trailers and whatever. That's YouTube.com slash Graham of Legend or GrahamOfLegend.com slash YouTube. Both work. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, and of course you can go to superspaceclub.com to get the direct link to steam to wish listed. There you go. Listeners, super space club, uh, look forward to it. August 4th, Xbox console exclusive. There you go. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> All right, exclusive. guys. <laughs> Take care. See ya.